This is the third time I've recorded this lecture. Technical difficulties. Pro, I know this material very well now. Con, my voice is shot. Today's topic is dry, it's banal, it's international, it's legal, it's consequential, it's well-defined. This is one of my favorite topics this year, right after one of my least favorites of all time last month. This month we get impacts to nuclear war easily, to climate change also, plenty of death, plenty of war, plenty of economic consequences, more terminal impacts and speculative link chains than you can fit in a presidential election. In other words, we're back, baby. Three quick things before we begin. First, all evidence cited can be found at debatetrack.com. Your subscription fee helps keep these lectures free, and buying a brief is the best way to support this channel. Thank you for supporting DebateTrack and for fueling accessible debate. Number two, all evidence cited is cut, same way as in debate rounds. It is not read verbatim. Number three, an impact brief. My incredible research assistant is starting to make impact briefs. These are collections of links and impacts around common impacts. The first one is climate change and it's currently live at debatetrack.com for subscribers. Expect more over the coming months. We're going to start with economics. These are links, the reasons that the economy goes up and down, and then impacts the reason why that is good and bad, or bad and good. Now I present your April topic. We'll start with a long background section, as usual, followed by two contentions for AF and two contentions for NEG. In advance, I'm always shocked and impressed by how many of you sit through these lectures on frankly fairly dry topics. I guess there's plenty of other international political nerds out there just like me, or debate nerds, or just people trying to gain the love of their strict immigrant parents with debate trophies. I don't know. Uh, okay, background. The United Nations was formed in 1945 after World War II with the aim of preventing future world wars. However, since then, its mandate has evolved to include spreading human rights, sustainable development, and upholding international law. The UN had its roots in the League of Nations, a similar organization formed after World War I, whose goal was to prevent World War II. Spoiler, they failed. Nobody asked me, but I would want to call the post-World War III organization the Council of the Glowing Phoenix. Tell me that's not cool. The UN currently has 193 countries represented with a number of other observer states and others who sure would like one of them fancy placards. Uh, you may see in the evidence, by the way, other numbers, 192 countries, 191 countries. That is because sometimes we get extra countries. We don't usually get less countries, but sometimes we get extra countries. To help the countries of the world better cooperate on the various goals of the UN, it has six main bodies to focus on specific issues. One, the General Assembly, the main body of discussion. Two, the Economic and so Social Council for Economic and Social Matters. Three, the International Court of Justice to adjudicate matters of law between different countries. Four, the UN Secretariat, the administrative arm of the UN, essentially the UN's executive branch. They just do stuff. Five, the Trusteeship Council, administered former UN trusts. It's been inactive since 1996. Most people don't actually include this in the list. I don't know why I did, honestly. And six, finally, the body will be undressing today, the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council was set up to maintain world peace. It has done a questionable job of this, although, hey, no World War III yet, so not all bad. The Council uses a number of tools to punish countries that interfere with international peace, including interrupting economic activity with sanctions, stopping communications, severing diplomatic relations, or authorizing intervention by any means necessary, and I think that just means military, I think. These tools have all been variously employed to essentially punish or help to change non-peaceful countries, although again, the effectiveness of these tools is certainly an open question. The Security Council uses resolutions or written plans on doing something as the primary mechanism through which the UN establishes its policies, manages actions, addresses global issues. This is how the Council plans out condemnation of a country or group, imposition of sanctions, or authorizing military intervention in a conflict. If you've never done Model UN, you should probably look up one of these resolutions and read it just to get an understanding of what I'm saying. They write down something and that's what they do or say, etc. You'll see the Council, also referred to by the abbreviations UNSEC, UNSEC, uh, same spelling, 
most commonly it's UNSC. And I don't know if there's a better way to say that, but I like UNSEC. Next, military interventions. These are called peacekeeping missions. And that is not like some kind of double speak. They generally are actually peacekeeping missions. These are enforced through peacekeepers. These are military forces in, uh, provided by UNSEC member states and funded by the main UN budget. That's why they're called, or they're also called blue helmets. You can see why they're called blue helmets. The UN and specifically the Security Council was originally set up to prevent conflicts between states. The council intervened in notable between states conflicts with a mission in Cyprus, for example, where the UN still works to hold uh, peace between Greece and Turkey and a US intervention, also for example, against the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in the early 90s. However, the council has also failed to stop a large number of wars since its founding. Recently, the Ukraine invasion, but also the 2003 Iraq invasion, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and about a thousand other wars. Conflicts within states are often called civil wars. The UN Security Council has intervened in a number of these, Sierra Leone, Sudan, Congo. But again, a number of internal conflicts have been largely bungled or avoided by the Security Council, including Bosnia and Rwanda. The Council has 15 permanent members. This, by the way, is our topic for the month. I don't have a resolution discussion because it's fairly uh, straightforward. It is in the description of this video. The Council has 15 members, five of which are permanent members. US, Russia, France, UK, and China. The five major victorious powers after World War II, otherwise known as the Big Five or P5. Despite the fact that countries like Brazil and India and Japan and Turkey have risen to prominence, the permanent members have remained the same since 1945. The reason we have this P, uh, P5 in 2024 is because they won World War II. That is the reason. Likewise, these five countries are all nuclear armed countries, but there are four other nuclear armed countries, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, that are not represented as permanent members. A side note, China and the Soviet Union have both changed governments since their founding, but their predecessors, Russia and the CCP-controlled mainland China, still hold those seats. Again, the Security Council has 15 members total, the five permanent members, and 10 elected members, known as the E-10. Each serves two-year terms and is elected to represent a certain region of the world. Sometimes these countries are quite small, but... Sometimes there are larger countries, permanent member aspirants like Germany or Brazil, and because they're elected by other countries, larger and more powerful countries tend to get elected more. The chart illustrates this, although again, sometimes they're kind of tiny. The presidency of the council changes between the roster of countries based on alphabetical order with each presidential appointment serving one month. So you've got 15 members total, two year terms, one month apiece, and then there's an odd one out. I don't know what happens to them, but everyone, most of the people get a chance, at least at president, as being the president. All members, uh, permanent and non-permanent, must have a representative at UN headquarters in New York City at all times in case of emergency. The E10 allows all regions and many countries to have a voice on the Security Council. Awesome. However, the E10 have comparatively little power compared to the P5. First, because of the obvious lack of the veto. We'll talk about that throughout the rest of the lecture. Second, because a two-year term does not give you quite the experience, the clout, the institutional knowledge that a consecutive 80-year term gives you. And third, because very few countries can actually compete in practical terms, economically and militarily, with the military and economic might of the P5 countries. So, where did we go? United Nations was founded in 1945. Emanuela Dallas is an executive research associate at the Asia Society. We'll hear from her a lot this lecture. Quote, Focus on the tensions amongst the P5 has overshadowed the fact that on a day-to-day -day basis, the division that matters most is between the P5 and the 10 elected council members. It is difficult to overstate the degree to which the P5 dominate the council's agenda. The P5 claim to have the responsibility for the drafting of council resolutions almost, uh, of almost all situations, thereby largely marginalizing the E10. Permanent members have one particular superpower on the council, the ability to veto 
or block any Security Council resolution. These members don't have to agree to a resolution, they can abstain from voting, or they can offer their agreement by voting in favor of the resolution, but a veto from any of the P5 members kills the resolution dead on the spot. On the one hand, that gives a lot of power to the permanent members, AF will argue too much of course, and again these permanent members have not changed in the 80 years from which the UN was founded. But on the other hand, when the US UN was founded, the veto power was seen as a concession to these big powers. It was seen as a necessary incentive for them to come to the table. Because why would a country like the Soviet Union or China subjugate itself even in word to the will of other countries without some means of negating or vetoing any resolution that they didn't like? And of course, this is how it's generally used. There's a controversial matter between, between the US and China, the US and uh, Russia, and whichever one doesn't like it uses their veto power to make sure that that resolution does not pass. Now, you might be thinking that a P5 member embroiled in some kind of conflict shouldn't be able to veto resolutions on that conflict, right? The UN Charter, its founding document, does make an effort to stop this, but in practice, P5 members don't challenge each other's veto right out of fear that their own veto rights may be restricted. An agreement among general countries, as it were, to ignore the rules of the UN. Magidin Shalimov, 22, note recent examples of Russia vetoing resolutions on Ukraine. Should they be able to? Probably not. Did anyone stop them? Yeah, for sure no. The pocket veto is the threat of a vote. Because most discussions of the Security Council take place behind closed doors, as it were, out of session, and directly between diplomats, P5 members can share their intention to veto a resolution as a way to neg negotiate changes in the language, thus exercising the pocket veto. If I'm representing the US, you tell me your plan, I say, no, we're not going to vote for that. That's a pocket veto. You've got to change something about your language that we can negotiate, otherwise it's going to get a veto once it is uh, put to a vote. Only through effectively negotiating language, therefore, that none of the P5 object to can UN diplomats effectively pass resolutions. Dallas 18 notes that the pocket veto is a normal, often used tool which continuously influences the functioning of the Security Council. So it's not something that's just in the background, it's used often. In terms of the significance of the veto, the most practical direct impact of the veto is that any resolution passed by the Security Council will have the agreement of at least five major world powers, or at least will have their tacit assent. None of them will object to the resolution. There are, though, criticisms of this mechanism. Sangpuda 14 from the New York Times, quoting Jared Arad, a former French ambassador to the UN, quote, When you have a crisis where a major power has a national interest involved, they'll try to block interference by the Security Council. The UN, he said, ends up being in charge of crises that are of no interest to anybody, end quote. But how does the veto actually restrain a country's actions? In effect, it depends. If a country wants to act despite not getting approval from the Security Council, it can absolutely do so, and then their action just becomes a matter of not support from the United Nations, support from the Security Council, but just a matter of power and practicality and their ability to withstand whatever punishments the UN and other countries dole out to them, if, if any. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is just such a case, although asking the Security Council for permission to invade may sound insane in practice, doesn't really matter either way if Russia has the will and the means to accomplish its goals and absorb the sanctions that Western countries have leveled on it. Of course, the Security Council can't act on the invasion of Ukraine because Russia is not going to pass a resolution that censors itself. Another example is the US's 2003, not early 90s, but 2003, different, invasion of Iraq. The U.S. never asked the Security Council for permission. Again, it would have been absurd and would have almost guaranteed being shot down. But the U.S. and some allies launched the invasion anyway. Bosco 12 also notes that the veto gives plausible deniability to a country that had no intention of following through on something anyway. It's like kind of having a friend hold you back in a fight, you know, like, let me at him. Uh, countries can pretend to have all kinds of humanitarian intentions that are sure to be blocked by the veto, leaving them on a superior moral ground while not having to do anything at all. In other words, they can say, look, I want to help you. I really, that's really what I want to do from my heart. I just want to intervene. I want to help out. I want to do my best. 
But they vetoed it, so I can't, you know? I want to, but I can't. So obviously, look, permanent membership has its issues, but how might we go about actually reforming the council? There are a number of propositions for reform. I will briefly present four here. Uh, solvency first, and then four plans, the last of which is AF's plan for the month. And we'll end our background session. So, solvency. Can the United Nations Permanent Five or their veto power actually be reformed? No, it can't be. Um, the permanent membership just is not going to, uh, the, the, the reform of the permanent membership is just not going to happen absent any reason that is more compelling than anything that we've seen throughout the last 80 years of UN history. Any reform would mean less power for the P5. And because the P5 have the veto power, they're not going to vote for something that gives themselves less power. Here is Dale and Dutton, 23, quote, Real structural reform remains a distant prospect. No matter how much they publicly acknowledge these unjust rules, permanent members are unlikely to undermine their own advantage in the council, end quote. Now, solvency is not a direct argument for NEG because, as usual in public forum, AF holds fiat power, the ability to assume that the plan will, in fact, take place. But solvency does cause downstream impacts that could play into some arguments. Okay, now for the promised four reform plans that will never come true. First, we could make the UN more representative and decrease the relative power of the P5 by just adding more permanent members with their own veto powers. There are a number of contenders. India is the world's most populous country, cooperative ally of four out of the five P5 members, nuclear power, the world's number five economy. If there's one country to get a seat, it's probably them. In fact, this was exactly the public forum topic in March 2019. Brazil is another potential shoe-in, second largest country in the Americas after the US, the world's number nine economy, home to the Amer uh, Amazon rainforest, a crucial part of the global ecosystem. Adding Brazil would also represent South America, a currently unrepresented continent. Japan is another country high on the list with the world's number four economy, number 11 population, rapidly growing military, a center for high-tech exports. China would never allow it. Africa, another popular proposal, would see two permanent seats in Africa, but which one or ones best represent the continent are up for debate. One thing is for sure, Africa is wildly overrepresented in UN resolutions, so some kind of permanent representation would make a lot of sense. The largest contenders for the spot are South Africa and Egypt, and finally Europe. Europe already has a seat through France, and half a seat maybe through the UK, but the European Union specifically wants a dedicated seat. If the EU seat uh, could not be granted. Germany has also made appeals to be added to the list as the world's number three economy, Europe's biggest population, and arguably Europe's de facto leader. At least they would argue it, right? All of these countries have petitioned in different ways to be added to the permanent roster, so uh, it's relatively to find, easy to find evidence. If you want to make some case contention, just look into any of these countries, join the list, easy to find. Second method of reform will never be implemented, like the rest of them. This is changing the veto structure by either simply abolishing the veto, no veto, no problem, or by requiring two vetoes instead of one to block a resolution. In this case, the permanent members could retain their spots permanently, but without their overpowered ability to single-handedly stop any resolution that they don't like. Next, 2022 saw a notable reform to the General Assembly in order to hold the veto power accountable. This is a General Assembly reform, not a Security Council reform, so important to note, but this has actually been enacted, so that's interesting. Uh, th this is Resolution A Res 76262, which says that the GA will meet whenever a veto is cast in the Security Council to discuss the veto and try to hold the veto user accountable. Again, this is not a Security Council reform per se, but an important step to further engaging the General Assembly in matters of international security. Rebecca Barber wrote her PhD thesis about the role of the UN General Assembly in preventing and responding to atrocities. She analyzes the resolution's intention and its uses, including critiquing the veto or taking some kind of action by the GA outside of the Security Council. So uh, critiquing the veto doesn't really have a whole lot of power. It just says, look, we don't agree with that, or there's some issues with 
with that. Like Russia, why did you use that? This is a U Ukraine resolution. You shouldn't be voting on this, for example. But it's really just words. And then any kind of action says, you know, look, Security Council, you can't deal with this matter. No worries. We will handle it now. So this is one area that reform has worked seemingly effectively, although it's still the early days. And really only time will tell how much this transforms the role of the Security Council and the P5. And if you were an enterprise and debate student, I might look into the other uses of this. Uh, Rebecca Barber and her piece is a... Uh, it's analysis of three different uses of a res 76 262, but I'm sure there have been others since. The last reform that will never actually be done and our topic for April 2024, abolishing permanent membership altogether. This would, of course, abolish the veto as well and knock the P5 down from their lofty pedestal as de facto controllers of the globe. We'll spend the rest of this lecture talking about some of the pros and cons of this plan, but there are some open questions that nobody has an answer to that might inform the structure of your arguments a bit. First, if the P5 were abolished, would that leave only the E10 left? Or would there be 15 total, all of them being elected? Or would the change correspond with another increase in the total numbers of Security Council members? Nobody really knows. And then countries, again, given any change, would the remaining members still be elected? Would they be elected from certain regions? Would those be the same regions? Would there be some... Uh, switch up in the regional composition. This is sort of like removing a few bricks from a castle. It's going to shift. We're not really sure how. And uh, these are open questions that could make the AF world better or worse. Uh, before moving on, I want to note that both AF and EG, as presented in this lecture at least, hold the view that the UN is essentially good and important and powerful and the world will be worse off without it. Thus, any action that reduces the legitimacy and effectiveness of and participation in the United Nations is bad. However, there is a possible critique of the whole debate, the whole structure, which says that the UN should be abolished. It's ineffective, unsuited for the modern world. It's a huge waste of money. And the world really would be a better place if the whole thing were just scrapped. Uh, for reference, I don't have any cards cut to this effect. But it is a possible critique with a C or a K. However, there are a few cards cut to the opposite effect. Oh, by the way, this, this picture, look, I, I don't know who this is, but they're selling a book. So if you want to buy a book and you got money, you can buy the book. I don't know if it's good. It might be awful. I have no idea. I haven't read it, but I found a picture of it. Impacts, few cards that say the UN is great. Human rights, non-proliferation, peace, norms, organized crime. Uh, should be easy enough to find others. The norms card in particular, Sonbeck 20, I think is um, fruitful, non-proliferation, obviously. Uh, and I spent probably an hour and a half finding these, so it should be very, very easy to find more impact cards. If you're going for any particular impact about the UN losing legitimacy, losing influence, losing power, and needs some kind of impact, should be not hard to find. The UN is kind of famous, you know? Okay. Now... Affirmative. And I'm happy to start with affirmative because this is, you know, uh, let's be honest, this is really the truth. Uh, if you've been paying attention even to the background section, it's obvious that permanent membership has to go. Permanent membership allows a select group of colonial powers to rule the world according to their own whims, making the Security Council largely ineffective at maintaining peace around the world and ensuring that none of the interventions that are approved have the input of a representative sample of the world's countries. Failure to abolish the permanent membership ultimately leads to the UN losing legitimacy until the world's only governing body fades into irrelevance as countries seek other forums to voice their opinions. Contention one out of two is ineffectiveness. The most perverse direct effect of the veto power is that the P5, all current or former empires, can do whatever they want without interference from the Security Council because clearly any resolution brought against them will fail due to the veto. And the P5 too often are the aggressors destabilizing peace around the world. Because after all, you don't get to be a huge country by not taking over other territories. Stuart Patrick is a senior fellow and director of the Global Order and Institutions Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Quote, To a growing proportion of the world's governments and citizens, the council today is both feckless and unjust, dominated by irresponsible and unrepresentative powers inclined to abuse their positions rather than safeguard the peace. 
The P5 have often contributed to violence. Russia, most egregiously, is embroiled in a war with Ukraine that many fear could trigger a third world war. Federica de Alessandria is a director, and Gwendolyn Whitten, a PhD candidate at Oxford University. Could you get a more beautiful name than de Alessandra? If anyone knows a nice lady in that family, perhaps a director at Oxford University. Um, I would love to be Joel D'Alessandra. <clears throat> okay, that wasn't appropriate. I'm sorry. <sighs> Their quote, Gwendolyn Whitten and my future wife say, quote, the past two decades have seen a shift towards a multipolar world order and increased great power rivalry. This in turn has led to the rise of the great power perpetrator, a P5 directly involved in the commission of mass atrocities. Think China and Xinjiang and Russia and Ukraine while abusing its institutional privilege to block international action through the veto, and systematically contesting key laws and norms that underpin both protection agendas, such as atrocity prevention, and the multilateral system itself." End quote. Three examples of this. Ukraine is a tad less trendy since the current Palestine war, but given that we're still teetering on the brink of nuclear apocalypse, the Ukraine argument value is still sky high. And as in 2022, the Security Council is utterly toothless. In 2022, 141 countries voted in favor of a General Assembly resolution demanding an immediate end to the Russian offensive. And that's 141 countries out of 193, about 75% of countries. Yet the Security Council, because of Russia's veto, can't do a damn thing about it. That's Megid and Shalomov 22. Now, I don't like to casually throw around the word genocide. In fact, I think it's insulting to use it as casually as the internet, as casually as Reddit does. But if you look uh, at Xinjiang, you can start to understand what an actual genocide looks like, which is, let's have this group of people not exist anymore. Starting in 2014, the Chinese government started to crack down on the Xinjiang Uyghurs, minority population with separatist tendencies. They make great lamb skewers. They're a solid source of hashish in China, circa 2013, or so I'm told. Since then, millions have been imprisoned. Families have been inter intentionally separated. Women have been married off to Han Chinese. Uh, native languages aren't allowed to be used. Local religions aren't allowed to be practiced, namely Islam. Many have been imprisoned, re-educated, used as forced labor. Uh, this has been going on so long, by the way, that I believe this genocide, you could call it a cultural genocide, but we may be splitting hairs when we use that qualifier, um, is probably complete. This is probably finished. If there were any intervention to... Um, Stop it. I mean, that, that, that day has long passed. But, you know, the punchline here, China has never been held accountable by the Security Council and has even used its incredible soft power in the UN to have the incident tabled in the UN Human Rights Council. Again, when a P5 power is committing international crimes, there's nothing the Security Council can do. This is not, I guess, an international crime. Let's call it a crime against humanity. Next one, certainly international. U.S. 2003 invasion of Iraq, which ended up killing some 300,000 civilians, um, and I believe about an equal number of combatants on top of that. Bad guys, you know? And by the way, to be a bad guy, it just means we call you a bad guy. Okay, now you're a bad guy. Uh, so how many of those other, the combatants, the insurgents, deserve to die? You know, probably not zero, but holy hell. This was largely seen at the time, and even more largely now, um, as illegal and unjustified. Uh, not only was the invasion not put to a vote, but of course any effort to prevent, stop, or punish the invaders would have failed. As the US and UK, both invaders and France, their ally, all hold the veto power. I believe France did not engage. I know Germany was opposed. Um, if, yeah, if you're running this argument, check the facts. <sighs> The permanent five as aggressors themselves, those are really on-the-nose examples, obviously. But in fact, the Security Council also fails to intervene anywhere there have been... They have an interest in taking a particular conflict or a particular ally off the radar of the Security Council. The guiding principle here for intervention is the R2P, Responsibility to Protect, which stipulates that the Council should get involved not just in matters of global stability, but also in genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity... Um, 
I should note, so uh, there was some kind of a symposium or forum of the United Nations in, I believe, early 2000s that decided that the Security Council should have these mandates, that they should get involved not just in things that disturb international peace, but things about the oppression of humanity, I mean, including death, torture, yeah, war crimes, genocide, etc. And so when you look at examples before then, uh, you can't sort of judge them by the same standards because it wasn't a mandate of the Security Council as the at the time. I'm still going to share a few of these examples with you. Again, De La Sandria and Witten 23, quote, Given its protractedness and high degree of visibility, this state of affairs in the Council has created a general and not unreasonable perception that the role of the UN in global atrocity prevention in response has declined and that efforts to advance the atrocity prevention agenda operationally have all but been abandoned. Let's start with Palestine. The U.S. has, as of, this is of seven years ago, used 15 out of its 24 vetoes to protect Israel and its ongoing conflicts with Palestine. While the U.S. is not directly involved, Israel is in some ways a U.S. protectorate with major arms, economic, political support coming from its superpower friend. And I don't want to discredit the uh, um, Israel nation, Israeli people, Israeli military. I mean, they are certainly a force to be reckoned with, have won plenty of wars by themselves, but it is undisputed that they would not be what they are without U.S. support. And uh, that goes quadruply true, or at least 16 times true in the Security Council. Um, I'm counting one from Fasihi et al., 1223, uh, just December. It says that in a December vote, the U.S. used its veto power in a 13 to 1 vote on an Israeli ceasefire resolution, with the U.S. again being the only power to vote against it with their veto power. Britain abstaining, France voting for the ceasefire. So I'm including this in the count, but there's probably other ones, I would imagine, that, again, that the U.S. has used its veto power to protect Israel. The vast majority of its vetoes have been for this purpose. Palestine is very hot right now for obvious reasons. I imagine you'll hear plenty of arguments with Palestine as a contention or an example, so be prepared for this. Syria has largely been off the radar since Ukraine, but things have not gotten better in the country plagued by decades-long Russia-U.S. civil war, proxy civil war. As before, resolutions meant to investigate the Syrian government's use of chemical and cluster munitions failed to be actualized again due to Russia's veto used to protect the side of the civil war backed the official Syrian government. That's Sibo 19. Reaching back in time a bit, the Security Council also failed to stop a large-scale war in the DR Congo or to intervene in it any way. Jean-Marie Mabombo is a senior lecturer and researcher at the Center for Peace and Strategic Studies. He says, quote, Between 1996 and 2002, approximately 6 million people perished during the African World War in the DR Congo. But world leaders applied the ostrich policy, pretending that there was no threat to international peace and security. End quote. In this case, the failure to intervene was largely logistical, political. The country is enormous. The regional politics are complex. The country's government didn't want any outside help. And any intervention would have required a mass of resources and a clear plan, which the Security Council absolutely didn't have. And again, it may have been outside their mandate at the time. So this is an explanation, but it's not really an excuse. We see here the Security Council is absolutely unable to stop massive tragedies. Something uh, quite related to this uh, that also involves the veto power more, 1994 Rwandan genocide, a true extermination campaign, a true genocide not just a war, a genocide that resulted in up to 800,000 deaths, mostly from a single ethnic group. And again, the Security Council failed to intervene with the U.S.'s pocket veto, preventing a resolution that would have been passed to intervene in the tragedy, instead leaving a more toothless resolution that left out the word genocide and therefore did not require intervention. Essentially, the U.S. had just been shell-shocked from its attempted intervention in Somalia and didn't want another African intervention and therefore vetoed the resolution. Okay, as if we haven't just gotten dark enough, let's go darker. Existential crises. Humanity has not gone through extinction yet. Yay! But given the Security Council's function, if such a crisis were to arise, only a fool would believe that the Council would be up to the task. The United Nations 1123 card elucidates how the frequent use of the veto shuts down urgent decision on these important issues because of the conflicting interests of permanent members. But fear not, debaters of the earth, we have a solution. 
Sansal and Zariba are political scientists at the Polish Institute of International Affairs. They say, quote, There's no longer any doubt that three primary threats endanger the existence of humanity, climate change, infectious disease, and nuclear weapons. Only global multilateral efforts can reduce their destructive potential. No other form is more suitable for such efforts than the United Nations. Ideally, the Security Council should be stripped of veto power when a matter relating to these existential threats is on the agenda, end quote. Obviously, if the permanent membership were abolished, these veto powers would be stripped uh, forever. And that, my friends, is, I think, an excellent reason to abolish permanent membership. So a big internal link here is legitimacy. If the UN loses legitimacy, it ceases to have any power. And any good things that come from it, like maintaining stability, promoting human rights, facilitating economic growth, are impacts that will disappear. And unless we abolish permanent membership, the UN will, in fact, lose legitimacy. So, let the quotes fly. This is all over the place. Nevarez 23, quote, It could be argued that the use of the veto itself threatens to weaken the power of the UNSC. And Anne 22, quote, There is now a resounding view that too many conflicts, violations of the UN Charter, human rights abuses, and atrocities have been failed due to the competing self-interest of the P5. Each failure further weakened the moral and systemic integrity of the institutions empowered to uphold international order, peace, and accountability. End quote. McKenna 15. There is one major issue that faces the Security Council. Legitimacy. It is no longer seen to be legitimate to concentrate power in the hands of a few states premised on their winning of the Second World War. By limiting the power of the veto, this would reduce the power of the permanent members to take arbitrary actions. End quote. This argument, linking the veto power to decrease legitimacy, is seen everywhere in the literature. And contention number two will continue to bolster the case that the UN, in its current form, just cannot be trusted. The UN Security Council is arguably the world's most powerful body. To have it dominated by only a few members means that they control the agenda and the actions of the world. As we talked about in the intro, a number of other countries are high on the list for being added to permanent membership. India, Germany, Japan, Brazil, South Africa, Egypt, and others. Africa is a particularly extreme example, as African countries are the subject of up to 60% of UNSC resolutions and discussions. That's Murthy 23, yet have zero permanent seats on the Security Council. Yet choosing a number to add, choosing which countries to add, and agreeing on all the details makes adding countries unrealistic. Abolishing the permanent membership would cut to the heart of the issues and immediately provide greater representation for the world's countries. As we have already well established, the permanent five can do whatever they want in spite of the opinions of the United Nations and to any member of the United Nations without the practical military power to fight them back. Augusto Lopez Claros is executive director of the Global Governance Forum. He talks about how this concern was evident even from the beginning of the UN. Quote, Related to concerns over the voting mechanism was the perception that the UN would turn into an imperialistic organization in which the permanent members of the council would be de facto running the world. The veto itself was perceived by many as undermining the democratic legitimacy of the organization. A major power can violate every principle and purpose set forth in the charter and yet remain a member of the organization by the lawful use of the veto power expressly granted to it. End quote. In the words of Korosh Ziabari, quoted by Dallas 18. The veto is a discriminatory and biased privilege given to five countries to dictate their own will to some 200 countries as they wish. End quote. Being a body with such centralized power, it clearly cannot represent the rest of the world. These P5 clearly have the incentive and of course will ignore the wishes of anyone else. Ferdas Salim is the commander as a commander in the Bangladesh Army, quote, The allocation of non-permanent member seats is not demographically representative or equitable geographically. The UNSC is controlled by the P5. The collective voice of 193 states is irrelevant in the UN decision-making process, end quote. Of course, what country could possibly feel represented, heard, or a viable participant in any way in a system like this? Next, how exactly did these large powers get to be in charge? How did the P5 become the P5? As we've already talked about, they won World War II. How did they win? They were powerful. 
How did they become powerful? This power was collected over time in the form of money, taxes, resources, territory, slaves, exploitation. And who did they collect it from? Well, from those other countries in the UN that do not get their lucky spot on the permanent five. I have only one source here. It's a long quote, but as with all my long quote choices, I think it's particularly good. The only way forward is to acknowledge the key difference between 1945 and 2020, decolonization, and abolish the permanent members of the Security Council altogether. Here's why and how. The roots of the UN are deeply colonial. Back in 1945, four out of the five members of the P5 were colonial states. Over the 75 years of the UN's existence, 80 former colonies have gained independence, from India to Kenya to Nigeria to Kazakhstan. The UN's structural inability to compel the P5 countries themselves to act decisively for the greater good is often acknowledged as a key justification for change, but this is often countered with economic arguments that we are all better off now. This counter does not hold water. The P5's failure to distribute economic benefits to the rest of the world, despite decolonization, is also a structural problem that justifies change. There is no country in the world that deserves a permanent seat. Veto-based decision-making on behalf of others, as the Security Council does, should be earned, and criteria for responsibility and capability transparently demonstrated and rewarded. End quote. That's Ryder, Beish, Nagugu, 20 researchers at Development Reimagine, a development-focused research company. By the way, with a lot of these names, look, I'm just trying my best. I kind of like confidently power through them. Doesn't mean I'm pronouncing them right. I just, you know, full steam ahead, you know? <laughs> you got the confidence, people believe you. Yeah, he knows how to pronounce things. I don't know, I just say them. Speaking of confidence, first impact of representation is confidence. Every country knows the story that I'm telling you now. None of this is new or controversial, uh, although it may not be talked about in the open as much as it should. And if you know all of this, how could you possibly have confidence in a system like this? Megiddo and Shalimov, 22, say that, quote, unilateral obstruction in the council has over time fed into growing criticism of the UN's alleged irrelevance on the international stage, end quote. Yeah, just a side note about this. If you are American, if you're from America, if you're born in America, raised in America, and you don't really know what it's like to not be from a country that is the world's largest empire that's ever existed. Um, try to talk to some people that are from, like, try to find the person who, who you know, who's from the, like, smallest, least powerful country you know of. And, like, what is their experience like growing up, you know, in, you know, Nepal or, uh, you know, Niger or something, like, What's that like? That's a very, very different experience, you know? Um, I don't know if you know anyone like this, but it's, uh, it's worth asking. It was kind of mind-blowing to me just thinking about, I don't know. I guess you all do debate. Maybe the, the concept that U.S. is not the center of the universe is not really new to you, but uh, this representation, I think, is it's very interesting, and I think as Americans we can sometimes take it for granted. So, second impact is splintering. As the world changes and the UN sec remains the same, rising countries like India, which lack proper Security Council representation, are starting to look to non-UN forums to affect change, thus leading to a splintering of multilateral institutions and a weakening of UN influence. Pant 20 is a great card on this point. And speaking of breakaway groups like BRICS and ASEAN, quote, these coalitions of the willing are viewed as more effective and efficient ways of dealing with not only traditional security issues, but also non-traditional ones, end quote. Again, if the world loses confidence in the UN, if it splinters, and if countries increasingly turn to more democratic organizations to control their des destinies, all the good that the UN does will be increasingly undermined, thus linking to big impacts for AF. Okay. Thank God we're done with that section, right? I'm thrilled we have made it to negative. I can finally stop lying through my teeth to you and tell you the truth about this topic. The permanent membership is an important, it's a vital cornerstone on which the entirety of the United Nations and the global order rests. 
Without the permanent membership, effective military actions would halt. The UN would cease to be funded. The United Nations, as we know it, the best forum for nuclear armed powers to hash out their differences, would fall apart as major world powers stop participating and stop funding the UN. Contention 1 here mirrors AF, although AF was, of course, speaking nonsense. This is the correct version of the story. A note on effectiveness for NEG is that we are comparing the Security Council's effectiveness to having no Security Council. The bar here is not perfection, the bar here is good. And assuming that uh, if we had no Security Council at all, it would be pretty bad for that the Security Council gets excellent marks. And this frame, by the way, this is something I could have a whole damn lecture on, but we'll leave it at this. If you're comparing some policy or organization to a fake imagined utopia in your head that has never existed anywhere on Earth, you know, like a building of people in New York City that can prevent all crises and stop all wars. If that's what you're comparing the Security Council to, then your tape measure is broken. Three points here on effectiveness. UN SEC interventions, the importance of the veto to military actions of the UN, importance of the veto to funding of the UN. The UN SEC does, in fact, do incredible good, passing resolutions across a range of issues. And that Sonbeck is a director for A Path for Europe, that is, I don't know what that is at all, actually, but it sounds legit. Quote, Many UNSC resolutions have been passed to support peace processes, solve disputes, respond to illegitimate uses of force, and enforce sanctions in situations where peace and security has been threatened. UNSC resolutions have been central for tackling conflict situations and have also demonstrated that extensive joint action can be taken to respond to crises, such as the case of Iraq's occupation of Kuwait in 1990. End quote. But you might imagine that given the rift and ongoing Ukraine proxy war between the U.S. and Russia, is it a proxy war? Maybe. Security Council actions may have ground to a halt. Why would either let the other have any ground? But not so. International Crisis Group 22, this card says that 30 resolutions on non-Ukraine issues had been passed in the Security Council in the six months after the 2022 invasion. I count almost six, uh, 50 resolutions passed in 2023, about 50 passed in post-Ukraine 2022, four passed so far this year, bringing the total to over 100. 100 resolutions passed that were not vetoed by the U.S. or Russia after the in invasion. The U.S. lists these all, the U.N. lists all of these on this website. You can read them. Again, if you have never read a U.N. resolution, you should pick at least one and read it. Um, but I just counted them. So in other words... Uh, the Security Council is quite effective even if there are ongoing disputes between two veto-holding members. This ability to cooperate is by design. It's not an accident. Again, Dallas 18, quote, Without the veto, the UN would have suffered the same fate as the League of Nations. The veto allows Security Council members to set aside those issues on which they cannot agree, but to remain engaged on those others, the great majority of cases, end quote. In other words, despite the tensions, the Security Council continues to effectively pass resolutions on a range of security matters around the world. Now, we've already noted a range of peacekeeping missions and military interventions, the Kuwait War, Haiti this year, but none of these would be possible without the militaries of the world's strongest countries, and thus their ascent is needed. Thompson et al., 22, it is not here, but it is here. Quote, the organization was designed so that all major decisions would require the support, or at least the acquiescence, of the big powers, end quote. Abolishing the veto power would make those interventions possible, or impossible. Arden Hooper is a Master of International Relations student and a public servant in Washington, D.C. She says, quote, The UNSC has the unique power to take military action against aggressors. The UN does not have its own independent military, which means it must rely on national militaries and military coalitions to get the job done when the UNSC authorizes force. Now let us imagine, for example, that the veto did not exist, and non permanent members were pushing for military intervention in a small country in turmoil. If they cannot coordinate a coalition that is powerful and advanced enough to settle the issue, their resolution is useless, and nations will view the UNSC as weak and incapable." End quote. So, if the AF team bemoans, 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 if the AF team bemoans the fact that the Security Council can't solve each and every global problem, a fact that I also bemoan, but that they had some kind of magical power, a magical wand to make everything peaceful. 
Just imagine how toothless and ineffectual it would be without the veto power and without the backing of the permanent members. If the veto goes away, so do the militaries of the UN, and so does the funding, and for the same reason. Again, Hooper 21, quote, Abolishing the veto would make the organization less powerful and less effective. The UN risks losing a significant amount of funding if it takes away the veto from the P5, which would reduce their power and influence. It is unlikely these nations would be willing to maintain these large contributions if their power to control the direction of the organization is overtly taken from them, end quote. Again, we're comparing the council not to a magical wizard that creates a magical utopia without conflict. We're comparing the council to the absence of the council, or even the absence of the UN, an organization without funding, without money, which is what we would get in the AFS world. And on that balance, negating the veto would remove from the council any power it has and any good that it does. Contention two is major power backing. Aside from this day-to-day conflict-to-conflict peacekeeping, fact-finding, sanctioned missions of the Security Council, there's a larger issue the Council must hold at bay, great power war. In short, the great powers of yesterday and today wouldn't participate in the forum of the Council without the veto power. Again, it could not exist without the veto. Abrams 22 says, this is in relation to the U.S., although this logic could apply to any of the P5, quote, The veto is a critical tool of self-defense for the United States and the U.N. and for the defense of U.S. allies. How does permitting the passage of bad resolutions that undermine U.S. interests make the Council credible and effective? End quote. Sing 23 ties this logic to a kind of responsibility to protect global peace and reiterates the fact that the P5 would not keep playing this game unless this game is rigged with a veto. Quote, the creators of the United Nations Charter, the founding document, conceived that five countries, because of their key roles in the establishment of the UN, will continue to play important roles in the maintenance of international peace and security. Unless those countries saw some kind of power that only they hold, they would not be willing to participate in such a body. End quote. Furthermore, Ivan Krastov, a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, he says that the world will become less stable in the absence of the veto, in a piece arguing against its, abol- against its abolishment. Quote, the world will not be a better place. It will be a more unstable place, and while we can legitimately ask the question if the current permanent members of the Security Council are indeed still the great powers of our age, the question about the veto power should be treated separately. In kind of checks and balances of our time, P5's veto option remains an instrument of last resort in the resistance against uncontested power. Sorry, that card is a bit tricky to read. Uh, sometimes we'll get like really, really excellent sources, very, very qualified people, you know, some uh, European researcher, maybe they know 17 languages, English is their 15th, you know, uh, but English is the lingua franca, so that's what they have to write these papers in. And sometimes the ideas are solid qualifications, sound, English, eh. David Bosco is a professor at Indiana University's Hamilton Lugar School of Global and International Studies. He drives us home to the point that we know we're all arriving at here, right? The ultimate reason that Russia and the U.S. and China need a forum to hash out their differences. Quote Bosco 12. The most fundamental point about the veto is that you could not have a Security Council without it. The alternative to the Security Council is really no Security Council. As maddening as the Russian yet will be, that's a trade-off that few would be willing to make. As frustrating as it is, the Security Council is still an enormously useful body, not least because it institutionalizes the practice of great power security consultations. Bosco 12. Another note on these evidence dates, 12 is about the furthest back I'm willing to go. There's great sources from 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, but just in the debate round, it sounds kind of weird. Bosco 87. But really, look, Permanent five members have not changed in 80 years. So people have been debating this, again, since its inception. A lot of really, really good sources that still hold the same merit they did 30 years ago as today because, again, facts on the ground haven't changed. But um, just for the sake of debate rounds, you know, you don't want to give your opponents more avenues for attack than they have. Security Council is not the only forum for countries to talk, but it is the best one and especially when it comes to matters of security, and especially when those matters involve the world's large nuclear arsenals, it is the best. Any forum that reduces the chance of nuclear war, however imperfectly, is one we cannot start tinkering with. 
Democracy, as an idea, has values, it's fine. I'm a big fan of democracy. Human rights, they're laudable, they're important. We should all be striving to maximize them. Keeping colonizers in charge, that's perhaps regrettable. And I say that as a colonizer. But look, these are all shadows of arguments. They all pale in comparison to the merits of avoiding nuclear war and the preservation of humanity on Earth. In other words, which world would you prefer? A world irradiated by nuclear hellfire or a world where there's a bit less democracy? Alex Soltes, quote, Getting rid of the veto for resolutions concerning the use of military force is neither realistic nor particularly desirable given the current geopolitical climate. The P-5, specifically the U.S. and Russia, have prolifically exercised their veto power since the UN was founded. All P-5 members are at present nuclear-armed great powers. The reality today is that war and conflict between these powers is still a possibility. Regardless of the moral dimension, abolition of the veto in this instance is highly impractical. End quote. A dark topic indeed. Do you prefer these ones with big, big, big impacts? Or do you prefer impacts like, we won't have a bowling team anymore? Anyway, that's it for UN Security Council. Please enjoy the debates. Be sure to drop any questions or comments in the comments. Thank you for watching. Remember to be kind to yourself and to the people around you. I will see you in two months for the national topic. Bye-bye.